That's your kitchen that's all done in cedar like that? No, that's uh, one half of my office. It makes a lovely background. You have some skulls back there too. Sure do. Hello and welcome to Decoding the Gurus, the podcast where an anthropologist and a psychologist listen to the greatest minds the world has to offer, and we try to understand what they're talking about. I'm Matt Brown, I'm the psychologist, with me is Chris Kavanagh, he's the anthropologist, and today we are going to do a mini decoding, charting the descent, I think we might have to call it Chris, of one of our favourite stellar shining lights uh, in the guru sphere. Jordan B. Peterson. Jordan B. Peterson. That's correct. He was somebody that we covered early in the show. Our third or fourth episode was Jordan, and he's cropped up multiple times since then. But most recently, he conducted an interview on streaming politics and philosophy with uh, Destiny, Stephen Bonnell. He had a sit down and ended up saying a variety of of unhinged things that we will cover. But one interesting aspect of it, I thought and you thought, was to consider just a little bit where Jordan has come from over the course of us covering him. Uh, So we'll see today where he is today. And we'll look a little bit, just a couple of times at previous clips from earlier content that we looked at. And I I think you can see a lot of the seeds, but you can also see a difference quite clearly in the presentation style, if not all of the aspects of the content. Yes. It's a a pattern we've seen multiple times with our gurus, the tendency to have this trajectory. And we're still, well, we'll talk about it, but we go backwards and forwards as to whether or not it's indicative of some sort of psychological issue on the part of the guru or whether it's maybe the financial and social and attention uh, dynamics that um, inevitably drives them in that direction. So so we'll see. But I remember, Chris, when we first covered Jordan Peterson, like we, we looked at his book, 12 Rules for Life. We, yeah. um, and, you know, I, I think we were pretty moderate in our evaluation. We didn't love him, but I don't think he was – he was in our class of like the worst type of guru. Am I remembering wrong? Well, the episode that we did on him was about him reflecting mostly on his religious and theology infused, you know, view of the world. So there wasn't as much unhinged conspiracism in it as you now will often find in his his content, but that partly contributed to him coming across better. But I will say, Matt, you were fonder of him than I was <laughs> at that time. So, <laughs> Hang on, I mean, don't you don't you rick on this because you know people take your words and take them as truth. I invite people to go back and listen, <laughs> but you know this is just a general thing. I am overall a more harsh person perhaps is the way to put it. And you're more chilled and relaxed and that kind of thing. So, you know, just like with Scott Adams, we had different (laughs) opinions. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Gad said, I think. I think think he convinced everyone that I love Gad said. You said he was like a harmless old uncle who is embarrassing and, you know, saying cringe things, which is sort of true. So as you can see here, it's very sexy. Hi, everybody. It's been a while that since I've last hid it under the desk. <laughs> but you're right. No, you're right, Chris. I'm more easygoing. I have a greater tendency to give people the, the benefit of the doubt. I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm not going to apologize. That's all right. That. You should. That's part of why people blame everything on me. <laughs> but that's all right. The slings and arrows, I'll take them. Much as Jordan has throughout his career. So, Matt, one of the pieces of content that we covered was... Jordan talking to Brett Weinstein after he returned from his illness, his medically induced coma, and, you know, the subsequent process to recovery that he underwent in Russia and Serbia, wherever he was. That conversation is interesting because although that conversation includes the famous lines about 
Weller, hospitals kill more people than they help. I suspect that, that medicine, independent of public health, kills more people than it saves. I suspect if you, if you factor in phenomena like the development of superbugs in hospitals, for example, that overall the net consequence of hospitals is negative. Now, that's just a guess, and, but it's, and, and it could easily be wrong. But it, it also could not be wrong. And that is a good example. or a good, That's where my thinking about what we don't know has taken me with regards to the critique of what we do. The fact that it's even plausible is a stunning well, fact. you know, medical error is the third leading cause of death, yep. you know, and that doesn't take into account the generation of superbugs, for example. So it isn't like Jordan had completely restrained his hot takes, right, and was now a very mild and meek person. But it is fair to say that in comparison to Brett, he was a lot more restrained right, and a little bit chastened by his experience. Yeah, I just want to clarify the timeline here, Chris, because I think that at that point where he's recovering from his induced coma, that's not like at the beginning of his slide, at the beginning of his tra trajectory. That's like about midway through. Yeah, yeah. He had went mental <laughs> long, long before that. But yes, he, he had become famous. And that was part of the reason why he had the health issues with addiction and whatnot was partly related to him going on a world tour. So yes, this is this is not the earliest E.H. Peterson. This is uh, his return to the fold after um, being absent for some yep. time. So there's one point in it where Brett suggests that when he was originally doing his protest that he kind of saw where things were going. And, and just listen to this. You felt obligated to stand up and say no, which resulted, as you know better than anyone, in you being mocked for overreacting. And then here we are years later, and it turns out that you saw with absolute clarity what others couldn't even imagine. Yes, but so, I certainly didn't see what was going to happen to me. Right. With well, clarity, you know, so being right, quite I, I don't a strange think it, route. It wasn't possible to see what would happen with specificity mm -hmm. to you. But I th am I correct in uh, seeing that you knew that something very dramatic was likely to come from your standing on principle and that that didn't provide any license to do anything but make that stand? You heard Brett there invite Jordan to, you know, present himself as a, a foresighted prophet, right, of doom. But Jordan's self-pity kind of kicked in, you know, and saying, well, I didn't predict what was going to happen to myself. Like, that's that for sure. And then that catches Brett off guard. And in the longer context of the conversation, they do get back to endorsing Jordan as a, you know, a mythical figure that has risen Christ-like, right, from all the persecution. But you can hear in, in this response there that the Brett is kind of taken off, off guard by his unwillingness to just, like, respond in kind to the invitation to present himself as a seer. Yeah, you've got two conflicting um, garometer uh, priorities there. One is to be the sort of Cassandra, you know, with, with foresight predicting the future. I have some of the abilities of Cassandra. Cassandra was a seer who was fated to be entirely accurate in her predictions. Her torture was that no one ever listened to her. And, and that's the thing that Brett is talking to. But there's also the um, grievance, <laughs> the, the tale of woe, the tale of suffering that they've um, um, had to endure in, in their role. So um, Jordan's taking one of them, whereas Brett was taking the other, leading to the off-footing. The amount of effort it takes for you to get to the point where you can be productive in the day the amount that is riding on your doing it, the number of people who are listening to you and who basically need your influence in their life. And, you know, in some sense, it, you know, it is, <laughs> it's, it's a mythological story. And I know you will have spotted that a thousand times over, but just the, the Herculean effort, the tremendous amount that's riding on it and the degree to which you're, you're paying some uh, inhuman price in order just to continue playing your role is 
profound. And so the advice, to the extent that I, I don't have see any, how you can see that. It shocks me that you say that. I mean, that isn't to say I. You disagree? No, <laughs> it seems like that from inside here. The other point that I wanted to highlight from this conversation is there's a point at it where Brett is discussing the lab leak and how it's been all but proven, right? And this is part of his, it links into his broader anti-vaccine narratives because he wants to talk about how, you know, the pandemic was caused by the actions in Wuhan and then the pharmaceutical companies and so on have kind of collaborated to produce a non-effective vaccine, right? That they, all, all Brett's wider conspiracies. But listen to Jordan's response when he's invited to, to riff on that. Then you have to add that to the balance sheet with respect to the costs of medical errors, because it looks like if this was a, an escapee from the Wuhan lab, that it was an escapee from experiments designed to create a vaccine to protect us from future coronaviruses. So we can't say that with specificity, but if we look at the circumstantial evidence of what was being studied, how it was being studied, and what the likely purpose of those investigations were, then this is, you know, the mother of all self-inflicted wounds, and it is uh, downstream of naive thinking about the cost-benefit ratio of enhancing the infectivity of uh, viruses. I know, I did know that, that that's something that you've been tracking and pursuing. I don't have an opinion about it because I don't know enough about it to have an opinion. Um, so, Yeah, so um, interesting there. We see Jordan Peterson not really uh, picking up the stick that uh, Brett uh, laid out for him, um, saying that he doesn't really know anything about that topic and is pretty noncommittal. And then, so it really illustrates that at that time, Jordan Peterson, he, he's, he's still the Jordan Peterson that we know and love. He's still a God-obsessed, conservative bomb thrower in many respects, but he's not all in in terms of this all-encompassing conspiratorial view of the world where everything's connected, where the, the lab leak and the vaccines and public health and maybe whatever, wars in Ukraine or in the Middle East, where, where it all forms part of this rigid worldview, he doesn't seem to be at that place. Yeah, I think another reading of it is that he has not yet <laughs> familiarized himself with the positions he needs to take, right? Because around this time or shortly before, he had tweeted out on back then what was Twitter that he was going to get vaccinated. And he then got a wall of responses, you know, saying, what are you doing? You know, you've already been infected. Don't you know, right? Like his whole audience came crashing down, but it, it was kind of clear that he had not fully <laughs> absorbed the memo yet that, you know, the, the right-wing audience had now become like very skeptical of, of vaccines. So he, he kind of blundered into it. Yeah, yeah. And you actually saw an interesting pattern with Donald Trump, didn't you? Because um, for a while there and still at times, he, he likes to take credit for the speedy uh, way in which effective vaccines were generated. And while he's he's happy to throw people like Fauci or whatever under the bus, he, he sort of missed the fact that so much of his constituency had become so anti-vax and he had to kind of retroactively spin his message and he sort of he sort of does both at the same time now but yeah similar kind of deal where you've got you can clearly see the incentives in terms of what what the audience is wanting from them yeah but it can sometimes take a little while for the leader to catch up yeah so that's where he was okay now let's see where he's gotten to with vaccines. We use force for all sorts of things in terms of public health. We don't health. generally use force to invade people's bodies. How long have vaccine mandates been a thing in Canada, the United States, and the entire world? I don't think they should have been a thing. That's great I if think you don't think they should have been, but when you say we don't Geneva generally policy. use force, we absolutely use force. We use, look, we, we, look, we've enforced look, vaccines for a long time. Look, it's an important part of public yes, health. Yes, fair enough. We did it on a scale and at a rate during the COVID 
pandemic, so-called pandemic, that was unparalleled. And the consequence of that was that we injected billions of people with an experimental, and it wasn't a bloody vaccine. Of Just, course it No, it wasn't. Yes, it, it was. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It's what, not. Because it have a 100% success rate? You think it's a definition of vaccine? The whole point of the vaccine is to give your body a protein it's to train on so the immune system works. technology. Who cares if it's not the same? There's plenty. There's they different used types the word of- vaccine so that they didn't have to contend with the fact that it wasn't the same technology. There are different types of vaccines there certainly that are, are, that are M- different technologies. Fine. The mRNA vaccines is a type this of vaccine used to be technology. vaccines. Now this is vaccines. No, it was like this and now it's like this. No, no, no. It was like this and now it's like this. The MNR, mRNA technology was a radical qualitative leap forward in technology. You can call it a vaccine if you want to, but it bears very little resemblance to any vaccine that went before that. And the reason it was called a vaccine was because vaccine was a brand name that had a track record of safety and shoehorning it in that was one of the ways to make sure that people weren't terrified of the technology. And I you think know, the I reason it's called a vaccine is because they're injecting you with something that's inoculating you against something in the future because it has proteins that resemble a virus that infects there are your overlaps. immune system. Mm. He's, he's, on, he's on board now. He's caught up. <laughs> yeah, he's got the memos and the made time. But they, I think it's a really good illustration of how much he's ingested anti-vaccine talking points and how these are now just boilerplate on the right, right? You hear him there mention, first of all, the so-called pandemic, right? Pretty sure it was a pandemic, Jordan. Pretty sure there were millions and millions of deaths worldwide from a, a novel virus. That's that's the definition of a global pandemic. And secondly, the so-called vaccine. It's not a vaccine. It's using mRNA technology to deliver it. The, the, it's a brand, Matt. Vaccine is a brand. You know, yeah. that's the, it's the pharmaceutical companies trying to slip something in. Like, as Destiny provides all the correct responses there, to his credit, he by does. the way, I, mm-hmm. I, he does a better job, I think, than I would in that same situation. Uh, I think, you know, because of his debate bro style energy, he's fine at responding, you know, with exasperation and talking quickly. And he, he has a bunch of the vaccine responses yep. well memorized. So yeah, he he highlights that it's a, you know, it is a vaccine. It's based on the same underlying principles as all other vaccine technologies. And Destiny wants to make the point that like, a vaccine not being 100% effective is not the definition of a vaccine because by that definition, there are many previous vaccines that wouldn't count like that. So um, so he's trying to say, Jordan's trying to say, you know, we expanded it so that any, you know, that there's a huge change and, and Destiny's saying, no, it's just like, a, you know, it's a new delivery for it. You know, so, yeah. Yeah, well, having almost finished the, the excellent uh, book um, about the immune system from- um, Philip Detmar. That's it. He produces um, Kurzgesagt. Act. Uh, yeah, I mean, Destiny's correct. The mRNA technology for instigating an aspon- a response from the immune system is fundamentally, you know, it works according to the, exactly the same principles as all the other styles of vaccines, of which there are about, you know, four or five or six different ways of doing it with, with various pros and cons. But yeah, so so Jordan is has really absorbed, as you said, the anti-vax talking points. I mean, you and I can hear them. Maybe it's not as obvious to other listeners who haven't been exposed to as much anti-vax rhetoric. But yeah, you know, the so-called pan- pandemic and so-called vaccines that aren't really vaccines, but are actually an experimental thing. Yeah, and they haven't even been tested properly and so on. And I can give some more illustration of, you know, just how extreme his point of view is. There are overlaps training, between, between the mRNA technologies and vaccines to be sure, but they wouldn't have been put forward with the rate that they were put forward if they weren't a radical new technology. And it's bad in principle to inject billions of people with an untested new technology. Isn't it also bad in principle for billions of people to get infected with a worldwide pandemic that initially was causing a decent number of deaths, a ton of complications, shutting down world economies? Maybe, maybe it was. Maybe it was. So shouldn't we be able to engage like, in that analysis and figure out, like, if we look at the We're not engaging vaccine? in the analysis. No, because now we're, we're talking about whether or not vaccines happened. or even vaccines or not instead. No, 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 we're, no, no, don't play that game. That is not what I was doing. I was making a very specific and careful case. The mRNA v- technology, by wide recognition, is an extraordinarily novel technology. And that doesn't make it, it not a vaccine, though. Well, 
okay, it's a radically transformed form of vaccine. I don't give a damn. That still makes it something so new that the potential danger of its mass administration was highly probably, highly probable to be at least or more dangerous than the thing that it was supposed to um protect against. And we are seeing that in the excess deaths. We are deaths. absolutely not saying So are you implying now that the excess right. deaths were caused by the vaccines? Or I don't, it like- I don't bloody well know what they're that's caused what you're implying by. now. Well, the, look, if you're going to use Occam's razor, you're kind of stuck in an awkward place here. I'm absolutely are, not stuck in an This yes. is the most administered vaccine in the hit or inoculation or whatever you prefer to call it, the history of all of mankind. Jordan Peterson is still using the phraseology of uh, an intellectual guru, you know, are making a very precise and careful yeah. argument. No, you're not. You're you're mindlessly repeating anti-vax misinformation. So yeah, he there is so much about his position there that is just wrong, that the vaccines aren't effective, that they're causing more deaths than than they're curing. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see where he is. You remember Matt when he made the argument about the hospitals causing more deaths, right? And that was linked to him having a bad experience at hospitals. So a lot of Jordan's thinking about things tends to be based on like his anecdotal experience and vibes, right? And here he clearly wants to make the case that the vaccines have caused more deaths and more illnesses than the virus that they were designed to treat, right? But here's what he said. That still makes it something so new that the potential danger of its mass administration was highly probably, highly probable to be at least or more dangerous than the thing it was supposed to um, protect against. Mm. And we are seeing that, right? So he tries to kind of use the weasel words, right, and the probabilistic terms, but he still wants to endorse that that is it. So, you know, he wants Mm. to say it was highly probable that that was a reasonable concern that people could have had, but he simultaneously wants to make the case that we have seen that and that it is, you know, the, it's been observed now and destiny is correct that we absolutely have not seen that. They have not seen that. And they're not, they weren't untested. They went through, um, the, the, the various trials and monitoring and so on. So there are many things just wrong, like flat out wrong about, Jordan Peterson's point of view. And it just shows that he actually doesn't understand what's going on. Uh, what he's what's happened is he's been exposed to the run of the mill, bog standard, anti vax propaganda that's that's floating around out there. And he's he's repeating its talking points pretty mindlessly, but he's but he's still trying to use his his trademark, you know, careful analytical language. So there's two points there that uh, could highlight. So you mentioned this trademark careful language, right? So I'm going to jump back in time now to the transliminal interview that we covered. I think this was from 2017. So listen to Jordan talking about how careful he is and what he says. I've been in this situation for, especially for the first four months, where had I said one thing that was self-evidently non-credible, you know, that would have justified a claim of bigotry or racism or any of those things, I would have been sunk. And so I wouldn't say I'm pleased with my performance because it isn't a performance and it isn't something to be pleased about or displeased about. But I can say that to the degree that it's possible, I've done my best to say, to do what I said I'm doing, which is to say what I think as clearly as I can. He's been saying that a long time. He still says that, right? But you can hear there that he's much more kind of hanging his hat that that is, you know, people haven't been able to pin him with saying anything inaccurate. That is absolutely not the case now, right? Like you just go on his Twitter feed any day and he's, he's tweeting out, you know, endless memes. Here's him in comparison to that, Matt, talking about, you know, this issue about whether there's evidence that the vaccines have caused deaths. And you can hear him here trying to be slippery with the language. And I think Destiny does a good job of highlighting 
what he's trying to imply, but what he was doesn't want to directly acknowledge that he's implying. So we can pretend now that the conservative argument was just compulsory vaccines are bad because they infringe on my freedom. That wasn't the conservative argument. The conservative argument was that mass deaths were going to happen, mass side effects were going to happen. Uh, there was going to be all this corruption and stuff related to vaccine distribution, to the crazier theories were microchips and blah, blah, blah. None of that came true. Absolutely none of the conservative fear mongering related to the mRNA vaccines came to fruition. But now that's all forgotten. And that was used as an excuse. Of, what to, do you make of the excess deaths? There are, that for related to vaccines, there are almost none. This the mRNA vaccines have been administered excess, to excess for deaths related in to Europe. vaccines. Absolutely we don't know. No, no. We absolutely we don't know. know. We absolutely. This is second. like what settled science. What do we know for, in terms of vaccine related? No, 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 no. That's not my question. Excess deaths in Europe are up about 20%, and they have been since the end of the COVID par par Sounds pandemic. Sounds really high to me. 20%? Go look! Uh, Go we, look! I'll check afterwards, but um, is this including, like, the Ukrainian war with Russia? No, no, it's not including the Ukrainian war. Okay. No. What, no, are, no. are you implying that you think it's because of vaccines? I'm or? not implying anything. I'm well, saying you're, you're, what the excess deaths are. But what's, now, what is your take on what's causing it? Well, you said that, in, and you said that in a counter to me describing mRNA vaccines. You said, "Well, the excess deaths are twenty percent." That makes sense. That the implication is that the vaccines are causing well, it. Or some, okay, it? first of all, something is causing it. Well, that obviously, okay. yeah. something is causing <laughs> sure, it, or, or exactly. some combination of factors. Sure. Mm. Mm. Yes. There's a bit at the end of one of the clips we heard earlier where he again, you know, tries to draw. Jordan, when Jordan references these excess deaths in relation to vaccines, and then, you know, Jordan says, no, I'm not saying that's vaccines. And like, well, why are you bringing it up at this point? That the potential danger of its mass administration was highly probably, highly probable to be at least or more dangerous than the thing that it was supposed to um, protect against. And we are seeing that in the excess we are deaths. Absolutely not. So, are you implying that the right. excess deaths were caused by the vaccines, or I don't, it like I don't bloody well know what they're that's caused what you're by now. Well, the, look, if you're going to use Occam's razor, you're kind of stuck in an awkward place here. I'm because absolutely not stuck in an. This yes. is the most administered vaccine in the history, or inoculation, or whatever you prefer to call it, in the history of all of mankind. Every single organization around the world is motivated to call this out if it was a bad thing. So, one, I think Jordan's. Claim as Destiny highlights is wrong, right? Or he's repeating, you know, like a point that he's heard in discourse sphere about 20% yeah. excess deaths. And we've no idea what that's about, right? Like he strongly wants to imply it's because of the vaccines. But secondly, whenever called on that, like, are you saying that that is because of the vaccines? He doesn't want to, you know, acknowledge that that's what he's implying. Directly. So he wants to keep the, the kind of ambiguous space to say, well, I didn't say definitely. He's basically just going, you know, I'm just asking questions. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we yeah. don't know. We don't know what specific nugget of information uh, regarding excess deaths, some, what, whatever statistic has been thrown around. But they monitor excess deaths are very helpful. Right. This is something they monitor very carefully. But um you know, destiny is fundamentally just correct, which is that the number of deaths attributable to vaccines is absolutely minuscule. And it would have been very easy to detect them given the massive amount of vaccines that have been administered. You know, subsequent excess deaths can be, you know, attributable to the actual disease itself, right? To COVID yeah, itself. Yeah. Or, oh. you know, as Jordan Peterson does mention, you know, the knock on effects on healthcare systems and so on. And, you yeah. know, just. There's, there's, a, a, there's a whole bunch and destiny references, you know, the war in Ukraine, whatever the case might be. But every time this issue is raised, there are anti-vax sources who emphasize that it, it must be the vaccines. And every careful analysis shows that that is not the case and that the worst affect people are the unvaccinated, right, in yeah, uh, yeah. the demographics. So in any case, though, the, it is what Jordan wants to imply. And his previous statements, right, wanted to imply that the vaccines cause death, but he doesn't want to directly say that. He will say it sometimes by accident when he's in, you know, the kind of flow of his speech. But when he's trying to be pinned down on something, he'll retreat to, you know, vagaries and inserting kind of weasel words. So, yeah, that's... Yeah. Talking, talking about mm. Occam's razor and things like that. Yeah, I think what it says to me is that he's not getting his information about 
COVID or vaccines from any decent source, any scientific source. He, he's getting it from the memosphere, from yeah. powers, from people like Brent Weinstein and so on. And like, it seems to me that this has just been integrated now into his particular worldview. I mean, we, we saw this before, Chris, right? He's always, he's been a long standing opponent of climate change um, action. And we'll get to that. Early, <laughs> yeah. And early on, integrated that into his worldview, right? That this is all just a, a woke kind of scaremongering campaign trying to make us eat bugs and so on. So, you know, you can see how the science denial can can just be wrapped into to, to make everything fit with your ideological worldview. And that's that's also happened perhaps inevitably with vaccines because it's just fundamentally against his ideological worldview. The government has got to be doing in the wrong any attempts to do some sort of communal type thing where people are, are forced or required or obligated to do something must be wrong and don't trust whatever the so-called experts uh, are trying to tell you. So, yeah. yeah. I've got a clip from him responding to somebody who early on suggested this was early, early days in Jordan Peterson's rise to fame. And they wanted to suggest that, you know, in the loss of collective meaning that perhaps climate change activism could be used to unite people, right? This was the suggestion by an audience member. Now, they obviously didn't fully understand the extent to which Jordan Peterson is a climate change skeptic, to put it charitably, or denialist might be another way to put it, but listen to his response to this, or some of it. But the climate change issue is an absolutely catastrophic, nightmarish mess, and the idea that that will unite us, is that's, that's, that's not going to unite us. I mean, um, first of all, it's very difficult to separate the science from the politics, and second, even if the claims, the more radical claims are true, we have no idea what to do about it. And so, no. And besides, it's even worse than that. Here's, the, here's one of the worst things about the whole mess is, so as you project outwards with regards to your climate change projections, which are quite unreliable to begin with, and the unreliability of the measurement magnifies as you move forward in time, obviously, because the errors accumulate. And so if you go out 50 years, the error bars around the projections are already so, so wide that we won't be able to measure the positive or negative effects of anything we do right now. So how in the world are you going to solve a problem when you can't even measure the consequence of your actions? Like, how is that even possible? And, and besides that, well, what's the solution? What are we going to do? Switch to wind and solar? Well, good luck with that. Just try it and see what happens. We can't store the power. Germany tried it. They produced more carbon dioxide than they did when they started because they had to turn on their coal-fired plants again. That wasn't a very good plan. Well, we don't want nuclear. It's like, okay, what happens at night? Huh, the sun goes down. Well, isn't that something we shouldn't have taken, that we should have taken into account? Well, we got to flip on the coal-fired plants. Well, so it was a complete catastrophe, and all that happened was the price of electricity shot up. It was like zero utility. So that's, that's not a solution. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we should cut back. We can't consume as much as we, sh as, we, as we are all consuming. It's like, well, maybe, except the data that I've read indicate that if you can get the GDP of people up to about $5,000 a year, then they start caring about the environment and the environment cleans up. Once you mm. get that, oh, it's so much in there. But just that last point, you get the GDP up to $5,000 a person and then they, they start caring about the environment, and then it cleans up. So is this, what? He's, you know, it's, it's Constantine kissing stuff. Well, actually, this is the source, right? Like Jordan is reflecting Bjorn Lomborg, but mm. so it's actually the other way. But it's the same argument as Constantine Kissin wants to make that like, you know, the way to address climate change is just economic development and any restrictions on yeah. the production of coal or burning of fossil fuels will prevent economic development. So you're you're actually yeah. causing Yeah. You need to prioritize economic development because then once everyone becomes richer, then they'll care about the environment and then they'll implement some policies perhaps to prevent climate change. Cleaner, they'll produce cleaner energy, maybe, but, yeah. the, you know, as Jordan keeps, his argument doesn't entirely hang together because he wants to question whether even cleaner energy is it, well, better. Like, or well, he, well, he first of all questions whether or not climate change is real, but then he sort of operates on the assumption that it is real, but then questions, you know, that we can't do anything about it, basically. We have no idea what to do about it. Well, we don't need to um, point out all of the fallacies and just things that are wrong in the stuff that he's talking about with climate change. Let's take that as a given. I mean, my, my comment there, Chris, is that 
I could see how to, to some people's ears, he sounds like someone who is engaged with the science, who is thinking about the issues in a rational, scientific way, right? Because he uses yeah. that form of language. But to you and me and to many other people, many people listening, I'm sure, like he's doing nothing more than repeating very bad, fallacious climate skeptic well, talking points but he's do he does he's just doing it in that style yeah well he, he does it in that style he uses that technique that he often uses of the socratic dialogue with himself well you might say you know and and then like a little funny voice of the person objecting and he as with many of the people in that sector he highlights you know the demonization of nuclear fuel which is True, right? The, the, that is an issue that you can legitimately raise with kind of climate activists. So there is points in most of his content where he, you know, is raising a legitimate issue. But so are climate skeptics. That's that's the thing as well. They're not absolutely, you know, inventing everything or there's no legitimate points of criticism or issues about, you know, where you focus attention or so on. There are. There are issues there. But in Jordan's case and in the case of most climate skeptics, it is absolutely used for rhetorical purposes. They have a conclusion that they want to get to, which is that we shouldn't be taking any of the measures to reduce reliance on fossil fuels or try to change towards more renewable energies. And everything is back from that, right? And it, whether you have to denigrate the science uh, to show that there is climate change, whether you need to say the economics don't work out or whether you have to, you know, highlight flaws in the technology or whatever, whatever the case might be, mm. it actually is almost always tied to a particular political agenda, right? And and that's yeah. the bait and switch, which I don't like. And just to highlight this like rhetorical tool, um, which we heard in the Constantine Kissin speech about like kind of presenting it as either take any action on climate and end completely economic development, right? Or you're completely hypocritical. And listen to, to this. Jordan does it just as well as Constantine, if not better. What are you going to do about them? Well, we'll ignore them because we can feel good about, you know, being concerned about global warming. It's like, I don't, I don't, you know, one of the reasons, there's more trees in the Northern Hemisphere than there were 100 years ago. No one knows that, but it's true, and by a substantial margin. You know why, in part? Because people burned coal instead of wood. It's like everyone says, well, we shouldn't burn coal. It's like, okay, fair enough. What do you want to do? Burn trees instead? Because that's what poor people would have done. It's like coal isn't good. Well, it's better than burning wood. So these things are complicated. So they're, they're unbelievably complicated. And so, no, it's not going to unite us. And we're not going to do a damn thing about it either. So it doesn't really matter. So, well, what are we going to do? You're going to stop like having heat? You're going to stop having electricity? You're going to stop driving your cars? You're going to stop taking trains? It's like, you're not. You're going to stop using your iPhones? You're not going to do any of that. And no wonder. So, so no. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a very, a very strong rhetoric there. It does remind me of Constantine Kissin. How many of you are going to go home tonight and say, let's rip out our bathroom and erect a Siberian shithouse in the back garden? <laughs> and if you're not, why should they? 120 million people in China do not have enough food. I don't mean that they don't get dessert, I mean they suffer from malnutrition. That means that their immune system is breaking down because they don't have enough food. You're not going to get them to stay poor. Like you said, Chris, it's not that, it's not that there's not a grain of truth in any of the things he's saying, right? Like, the, like there, it might well be that there, that there is a reduction of economic growth associated with climate change action, right? I mean, I'm pretty optimistic with all of the technological fixes that keep coming along. Yeah. That actually there may not be as big a trade off as, as some people like to think. You know, a, a lot of, you know, cars are vastly more efficient these days. Our ways of, of using electricity are vastly more efficient than they used to be. So it's not necessarily the case, right? That there's a one to one relationship with economic growth or quality of, of life um, in material goods and energy consumption. And there are lots of other alternative sources of energy coming online, including storage. But yes, you know, there are technological challenges in storage and managing the complex grids. There are lots of points there. But when you are setting up a rhetorical platform, you, you take each of those things and you magnify them out to be 
you know, like you said, a total binary choice. You can either care about uh, or, or, or say it's okay for people in developing countries to get to get a little bit better off or you can do something about climate change, right? And you set it up like that and you go, well, of course we're not going to do anything about climate change. I don't know what to say except that, I mean, I, I could see how it's just kind of obvious that, that being, being an anti-vaxxer, being anti-climate action, it all just fits with what is a very common, very... I don't want to say boring, but it's just something I've been acquainted with for for, for 20, 25 years, basically, which is that if, if you're a conservative, then you don't care about these things. I also think that what Jordan wants to inject there is the notion that you might take specific steps, right? Like, you know, a carbon tax or something like that, right? To, to offset externalities that Jordan would be completely against that. But that wouldn't require that everybody stop driving cars, that everybody gives up their phone, that people in developing countries don't. You could even make it that there, you know, the, there was an, a, a greater burden put on the more developed countries, right, to make it not so burdensome on developing economies. But in those cases, like, Jordan's not interested in that. He wants to project it as you have this choice between making poor people kind of forced to deal with these concerns of elite, out of touch, people who are trying to, you know, restrain economic growth and don't give a damn. They're just all virtue signaling versus, you know, that you care about poor people and you're willing to accept that, like, not everything has to be focused on the standards of an elite Western liberal who's tied to a tree or that kind of thing, right? So Mm. he... He casts it in this extreme black and white, very simple distinction. The most extreme solution versus is the only one that you could possibly advocate. And if you're not going to do that, well, then you're completely hypocritical, right? And it makes the whole debate into a caricature. But that was him years ago, right? So let's see where he is now. And, and one thing to note there, Matt, is that you heard him use this thing where he likes to Insert, we don't know. We've said this many times when we covered his content. One of his favorite techniques is to suggest that we don't know anything. We're really, you know, just grasping in the dark about these topics. So we shouldn't really make any statement with confidence. You heard him do it there and he's still doing it now. I mean, I'm not going to tell you that every model is perfect. They're but not right perfect. now, sure. But right now, we're like standing in traffic with our eyes closed, saying the car hasn't hit me yet, so I don't think there's any coming. I think it's pretty undeniable at this point that there is an impact on climate across the planet. I, just I don't think know. that's highly deniable. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have terrible temperature records going back a hundred years. Almost all the terrestrial temperature. Uh, 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 detection sites were first put outside urban areas, and then as and the, right, and then you have to warm. correct. Then you have to correct for the for the movement of the urban areas, and then you introduce an error parameter that's larger than the purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure. This isn't data. This is guess, and there's something weird underneath it. There's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it. It has this guise of compassion. Oh, we're going to save the poor in the future. It's like, that's what the bloody communists said. And they killed a lot of people doing it. And we're walking down that same road now with this insistence that, you know, we're so compassionate that we care about the poor a hundred years from now. And if we have to wipe out several hundred million of them now, well, that's a small price to pay for the future utopia. And we've heard that sort of thing before. And the alternative to that is for, is to stop having global level elites plot out a utopian future or even an anti-dystopian future. And that's exactly what's happening now with organizations like the WEF. And if this wasn't immediately impacting the poor in a devastating manner, I wouldn't care about it that much, but it is. (laughs) It's, it's, It's hard to resist the temptation to just, but we just have to mention that he's just wrong, right? The, about the quality of the data. The quality of the everything data. Everything he just, said about we don't is, know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have no idea if there's uh, mm. climate change. Yep. We have no idea what's going wrong. on and we have no idea what to do about it. And it's just, it's all totally wrong. 
And if, if you look at the graphs of, of how much energy is coming, say, from wind and solar production, the graphs, are, it's still a small proportion of total energy production, but the graphs are exponential, right? So it is, it is already happening, right? Jordan would have you believe that it is impossible and that it just it can't be done. Um, it's not really happening. We don't know what's going on, so don't even try. But, you know, what, what strikes me, Chris, is the, um, in terms of the rhetoric and the, the words he's dropping there about the WEF, about how it's basically communism, how it's, um, it's a deeply anti-human ideology masquerading mm-hmm. as being something that, that cares about people and the rest of the planet, I assume. I think to me that illustrates just how much each of these specific topics are being just bound up into his all-embracing paranoid worldview. Yeah, I draw direct parallels to an Alex Jones view of the world. Jordan is talking about there being a secret global elite which is anti-human, which is using climate change as a kind of tool to depopulate the world. Right? He starts going on about the planning to wipe out millions and you know and call it compassion and all this thing and that directly from his point of view connects to this agenda to try and reduce the footprint of fossil fuels right and so it is all tied together and it's exactly the same opinion the the same worldview that Alex Jones and so many others have. And this is now not really a fringe position amongst the right wing, especially no. in America, North America, but, but you know, in Europe and so on as well. So it is obviously conspiratorial. And in Jordan's case, it's worse because like Alex Jones, it's tied to this millennial <laughs> theology about like an evil that is lurking underneath an anti-human evil, which is bending things to its will. And just to make this clear, Matt, here is one more clip from the same interview talking about that evil. Well, let's say that everything you've said is true. What do you think is the plan then? What is the goal? What is the drive? Like the why dr- push, why push obviously horrible ideas for the planet and the poor? That's a good question. That's well, a good question. Well, because you're positing it, right? So what, what do you think is the driver goal? Well, I listen to what people say. Here's the most terrible thing they say. There are too many people on the planet. Okay, so who says that? I've heard people say that for 30 years. Perfectly ordinary, compassionate people. Well, there's too many people on the planet. And I think, well, for me, that's like hearing Satan himself take possession of their spine and and move their mouth. It's like, okay, who are these excess people that you're so concerned about? And exactly who has to go and when? And why? And how? And who's going to make that decision? And even if you don't, even if you're not consciously aiming at that, you are the one who uttered the words. You're the ones who muttered the phrase. What makes you think that the thing that possessed you to make you utter that words isn't aiming at exactly what you just declared? And so that's, you know, that's a terrible vision. But when you look at what happens in genocidal societies, and they emerge fairly with fair regularity, and usually with a utopian vision at hand, the consequence is the mass destruction of millions of people. So why should I assume that something horrible isn't lurking like that right now? Wow. He comes across as a millennial fire and brimstone preacher, doesn't he, Chris? I mean, he's, he's got his full he's, ball there. He's absolutely inconsistent as well, Matt, because... Like there he's talking about the horrors of utopian visions, right? And the lurking evil that he's so wary of. What about MAGA? What about a make America great again? Is there a utopian vision in that movement, right? Like the, the slogan itself highlights it. Does Jordan have concern about that? No, not yeah. one inch. And I not did, one but, inch but, about various utopian images that, you know, people on the right propose. So I'm, I'm saying it's an inconsistent standard. But I also agree that it is a highly religious and conspiratorial one. You know, he, yeah. he's talking about, he, I mean, he references Satan, right? And you can say that he's speaking poetically, but he's also talking about the people not realizing how the thing which possesses them is moving them to express 
you know, it has malevolent intentions. And we know from the conversations with Jonathan Peugeot, with all the others, that they genuinely mean there are these evil lurking forces and they don't like to get pinned down and whether, you know, it's a, it's a like slime or ghost or whatever, yeah. but is a metaphor or an actual one. Yeah, no, but it's very real for them. Um, look, the other thing, speaking about the inconsistency, you and I have, have taken a look at some of his, the papers that he's published as a, as a research oh, psychologist. Yeah. And uh, back then when he was on his high horse about how the quality of data from geophysics and climatology is just rubbish, you know, it's just guesses, you know. Yeah. Speaking as a psychologist, I could say that's pretty rich coming from someone who's done the relatively low quality, low reliability, like the kind of um, conclusions that he drew from his very weak, you know, just typical psychology, small n experiments and things. You cannot hold a candle between the quality of that data and and the data from the <laughs> uh, geosciences. So, I mean, that just goes to show if he seems like, he, like a careful scientist, he's getting, you know, very concerned about the quality of the data. That's not that's not what's going on here at all. Yeah, that leads to the last clips that I want to play on because he, he has a study that he wants to carry out which hasn't been run yet and which he thinks can solve a pressing issue of our time. So, so what's the issue? Well, let me first let him introduce it. I don't think it's because Hitler's lack of trying led him to kill us people then, what, who ended up dying during the Great Leap Forward or during the industrialization of the Yes, well, I also think it's an open question still to what degree Hitler's policies were right-wing versus left-wing, and no one's done the analysis properly yet to determine that. Well, what do we consider? Because it was a national socialist movement for a reason. And the socialist part of it wasn't accidental. Well, but the so I mean, there was no, uh, you know, cooperatively formed businesses that were owned by all of the people for the people and distributed to the people. And I don't think redistribution was high on Hitler's list of That's things true. to do for That's true. Yeah. So, mm. yeah, that, that, that old chestnut. Uh, was <laughs> Hitler <laughs> and the Nazis right wing? Yeah, there's, I, I, Jordan's confidence with which he says, no one's done the analysis. Really? Historians haven't looked into the ideology behind the Nazis and they haven't overwhelmingly determined that it was a far right <laughs> nationalist if they, ideology. If they, as if you, you know, some even non professional historians might be able to figure that out. Uh, like it's not yeah. that hard. The thing which has tripped up Jordan here, which is very common amongst conservatives, seemingly, is that they use socialists in the title, right? National Socialism. Now, historians have known that, Matt, and they've addressed that. And it is true that the Nazis in the earlier periods tried to appeal to some of the dissatisfaction that was being scooped up by the communists yep. right, at, yep. the, at the time. But it was absolutely opportunistic. And you can see that because you just need to look at what Nazi actual policies were when they were actually implemented but in the Third Reich. And one of the first things was the targeted destruction of communists, right? <laughs> of of socialists. So it's it's just it's mind-boggling to claim that. But this is a common viewpoint amongst the right more recently, right? Mm. And and this speaks to Jordan's you know network of information. Dinesh D'Souza has written a book about Hitler you know, being left wing and, and so on. So all these polemical right wing figures, they, they want to categorize Hitler as left wing mm. because they they don't want him to be in on, the like yeah, on the right, which is so stupid. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> it, is, it is so stupid because there is, you know, admittedly, maybe I can just restrict it to Australia. Your typical person who votes for the Liberal Party or your typical person who votes for the Labour Party is not trying to usher in either a great leap forward and a five-year plan or the final solution the and, and annexing New Zealand, right? <laughs> it's just yeah, different. Yeah, I, so, yeah and, Australia, so, you're I'm fine. Just try, I'm just trying <laughs> to agree with you that it's just stupid. You don't need to sort of disown these historical things because they happen to be you know, no. on, on your side of the, the fence, right? Look, and try to find a way that you can make them out to be, oh, well, really, they were, they were on the other side. No. Look, we're moderate left-wing people, right? But Pol Pot, Stalin, Mao, right? Yeah, they were left-wing too. That's right. Yeah, they were communists. <laughs> that's right. But they were on the left, and that's, that's fine. The left can spawn extremists and extreme ideologies. 
just as the right can yes. and has. That's my point. Yeah. That's, my, that's my point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, so much of it is just based on misrepresentation. Like, just like he misrepresents, <laughs> like, the, there's just no question about where, where to place the Nazis politically. He misrepresents the literature on the climate and policies to either mitigate it or do something about it, climate change. I mean, I've read a bunch of these documents, Chris. You have too. There's nothing ut- utopian about them. The way Jordan Peterson represents it is that underlying all of it is this sort of crazy, hyper left wing, like ideologically infused person who is trying to create some sort of, you know, communist utopia and the Doing something about global warming is just is, is a part of that. Yeah, thing. Now, with the WEF. Like, like, the, yeah, <laughs> like I know, like you may find someone like that online on Twitter who's, who's probably just cosplaying anyway for for attention. But there is no utopianism in any of the the normal literature on this. It's just this is happening. We understand why it's happening. Yes, um, it's it's lovely to have these nice, cheap, available sources of energy like like oil and coal. But unfortunately, they do release carbon. How are we going to manage this problem? There's just nothing more pragmatic in my mind than that. There's no utopianism in there at all. Um, so it just irritates me. Like I'm kind of I'm not frustrated by people. Who go? Okay, I I think the most important thing in the world is the economy and economic growth. Yes, it's a shame about climate change, but I I don't think we should prioritize it. Right? I might disagree with the, them, but you know I can you know that's 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 their opinion, right? That's fine. But totally making it out to be something that it isn't, right? And and misrepresenting the the, the science of it and and creating like a fictional narrative to to justify the position you wanted to come to. That's the bit that it makes me upset. <laughs> yeah, I think the reason Jordan does that is because you would hear it if you listen to the full conversation. He will regularly reference like the most extreme extinction rebellion or yeah. whatever yeah. people, right? And use them just like we talked about with the speech. He will focus on the most extreme advocates or extreme claim and then basically present that as that is what the WEF or what the IPCC is all about, which it isn't, right? Like the the Extinction Rebellion people generally think the IPCC is too conservative and those kind of things. So that's part of the issue is there are utopian visions. There are people who have, you could say, anti-human agendas, right? The, the like extreme environmentalists, but they are not the mainstream. They are not the people trying to come up with economic plans to encourage renewable fuels at the... Yeah. WEF. And that's not the reason why countries like China are building solar panels, right? It's just, no. like China's got a lot of things wrong with it, but that's you know you've got a you've got a weird, distorted, nightmare world, a view of the world. If you buy into Jordan's millennial prophesizing yeah. about it, it's part of the issue with Constantine's speech as well. Is like that a lot of the people in the countries which Constantine claimed don't care about climate change in surveys say they care about climate change and re- support policies to try and prevent their environment from being polluted, right? Because that's one of the things about fossil fuels is they, you know, produce pollution. So, yeah, anyway, anyway, Matt, to anyway. return to the Jordan's plan to sort out this issue about the Nazis oh, and the Hitler. Nazis. Yes, we've got to figure out. Yeah. The right wing He's got a plan. Mm. It was but a I strange mix that, of, sure. of well, totalitarian but I, also, I don't think it was a strange mix. I think it was a bid to appeal to uh, mid-left and center-left, the KPD and the German Socialist Party, by calling themselves National Socialists. I think it was very much like an authoritarian, ultra-nationalist regime that pretty squarely fits with. I, people get mad if you call something far right or far left because they have a, an attachment Well, you know, terms, one but, of the things I would have done if I would have been able to hang on to my professorship at the University of Toronto would have been to ex- extract out a random sample of Nazi policies and strip them of of markers of their origin and present them to a set of people with conservative or or leftist beliefs and see who agreed with them more. And that analysis has never been done as far as I know. So we actually don't know. And we could know if the social scientists would do their bloody job, which they don't, generally speaking. That's something we could know. We could probably use the AI systems we have now, the large language models, to determine to what degree left and right beliefs intermingled in the rise of national socialism. So that's all technically possible. 
So, and it hasn't been done, so it's a matter of opinion. Sure. So, I, I don't necessarily disagree. Wrong, Destiny. You should. <laughs> I feel that he was allowing things to, you know, there's Jordan is just constantly saying things, so you got to pick your battles. But this particular one, uh, I don't agree with Destiny that, you know, he's not necessarily wrong. No, it it is a very silly argument because... Jordan's Jordan's claim here is that, you know, until we've run this silly little study that he's just imagined about anonymizing the Nazis' policies and presenting them to, you know, a, a wide spectrum of people, we'll never be able to determine which kind of people are attracted to the Nazi policies. We were, Jordan, in history, the people attracted to the Nazi policies Yep. were ultra nationalists yep. right yep. and then yep. artists they, academics intellectuals <laughs> were the victims they fled the country they were generally <laughs> <laughs> i think part of this is you know james lindsay if you recall the so-called squared people they tried to take a section of the mein Kampf, right and remove all of the references to the jews or whatever and kind of change the language and then submit it as a uh, journal article. And they wanted to show that basically, you know, the left have now become the, or maybe they always were, right? The authoritarians and they they would endorse the kind of authoritarian suggestions of Hitler. But in what James Lindsay did as one historian who specializes in the Nazis and, you know, their policies highlighted when looking into that was, they fundamentally removed all of the, you know, the almost everything about the the yeah. the section of the Mein Kampf that they focused on was one that already was the least objectionable, right? Was like, you know, arguing about economic changes and whatnot. And then when you change the target and you change the language, you actually change what is being uh, suggested, right? So like, if you have a policy, which is like, we will root out all the Jews and we will, you yeah. know, remove this this parasite from our midst. And you change that language till we will remove all the corrupt politicians and we will instigate policies that uh, enable financial reforms. You can say, oh, we kept the skeleton the same, but actually what you've asked people to endorse is, is very different, right? And like, economic populist policies or whatever are popular but that's not the bit about the nazi platform <laughs> which is which yeah. caused the problem so yeah, no, yeah it, it's, George- it's a silly it's a silly thought experiment he's got there like as, as you said you could take certain policies and some of them you could strip them of little signifiers that they're nazis right like one of them would be like they had a large-scale public works program right so they they weren't like libertarians, right? They believed in big spending to to build like the autobahn highway system and things like that, and deal with unemployment via yeah. just like putting people to work. So it, well, it did have that sort of um, you know state controlled of the economy aspect to it. So maybe that one you could, um, but most of their policies are, are quite specific. Like they had policies at strengthening the Aryan race, right? Promoting Aryan births, yeah. right? And sterilizing individuals with disabilities and euthanasia of the severely disabled. Now, it's pretty difficult to strip out. <laughs> like, how do you make, like, <laughs> what do you do with that one? Oh, yeah. Or, you know, the, the, admiration of the Fuhrer, right? The, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Fuhrer perverting printing. your will to the, the Fuhrer and the Volk. Well, well, like, here's, here's a really challenging one. How about the anti comintern Pact? So they formed the Anti-Communist Alliance with Japan and Italy. So how would you make that so it's not, so it's not left-wing <laughs> or right-wing? <laughs> and, I mean, it's a silly argument, but also silly because absolutely nothing's stopping Jordan doing this. He's saying, you know, they stripped me of my professorship. It's impossible. Jordan has repeatedly talked about how rich he is, about how much resources he has, about how his team is now better at producing research than they ever were at the university. And, and this so, is a this is a little research project that I could get an honor student to do because it's it's would be real, it's a stupid thing. I wouldn't get them to do this, but it wouldn't cost hardly any money. No, know? it would cost nothing. You could run this tomorrow, right? Like <laughs> so Jordan's saying it's impossible to do it. And you know, he was about to do it until the the woke mob stripped them 
from his professorship. Not true, Jordan. First of all, you you had your professorship for many years and you didn't show any sign of running uh, any study like this or generally good studies. You're bad at study design. But secondly, that his second suggestion is LLMs. Maybe they could do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, we could do that. You could just go and check now, Jordan. If you type into <laughs> any any of the LLMs that are you know currently existing and ask them that exact question about the degree to which left and right beliefs intermingled in the rise of national socialism, I will tell you now that they will all correctly identify that it's the right wing beliefs which were the driving force and. Mm. The only exception will be the weird conservative gab AIs, right? The ones which are explicitly anti-Semitic or wh whatever the case might be. So, mm. he, again, he talks like it's impossible to do this. Well, immediately after he did this, people went and asked Chat GPT, and you know the answer was that yes, it's uh, you, you know the Nazis made use of left-wing rhetoric, but they uh, abandoned that as soon as it was politically expedient so all right i'm just typing into i've we've already asked gpt4 let's ask claude we're doing claude, it live yes, claude. were the nazis right wing oh yes apparently the lmls have solved this eventually <laughs> there's even that there's a <clears throat> historical fact or quirk about that period that in the german parliament the parties were geographically positioned according to where they located themselves on the left to right political spectrum. And the Nazis chose the far left right position, <laughs> the chamber. So they actually sat, you know, in the far left right geographic location so, at so that the, point. So this is another research project. You've just given Jordan an idea. He could go and ask a Nazi. He could ask the Nazis. Uh, if they're right wing or not, I, th I think that be there's a weird. little. You must have seen that meme, Matt, where there's the question, you know, were the Nazis right wing, and everybody is saying, you know, it's like far left, yes, center left, yes, moderate, yes, like, and it has the Nazis saying yes, yeah. oh, and yes. the only ones saying no are, you know, the conservative right, yeah. like the, you know, Jordan Peterson, Dinesh D'Souza, the, that's the only one saying no. Yeah. So yeah. even the Nazis themselves were quite clear that they were, you know, a, a right-wing movement. I mean, they were fascists, Matt. They were freaking fascists. <laughs> I, I, I get so. it. I get it. I think everyone gets it. We can we can stop belaboring this point. But, you know, I think it's a good one to make because if Jordan Peterson is so addled that he thinks this is an important point to make and to the extent that he's thinking through potential research strategies that are going to get to the bottom of this, I mean, it just illustrates how in common with those other two topics we covered, you know, the, the vaccines and climate change, it just illustrates just how strongly it is his political ideology and paranoid worldview that is driving his take on, on any given thing that you might think about. Yeah, and he's got a set, like a little bag of rhetorical techniques. One is his like, uh, intellectual puppet show, well, you might say that I'm saying, blah, 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 right? Uh, th that's one of them. The other one is, we don't know. Nobody has done the work. Nobody has any idea. That's another thing, right? I'll, I'll add one to that. I'll add another technique, which is that scientism really gets my goat. You know, that... Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, if we ran his like, crappy study. <laughs> yeah, and, or, or, or pretending that his concerns about climate change is because the, the data isn't of a high enough quality, that, you know, there are some biases and they, they made some yeah. methodological errors. And it, it is pretending. It is nothing more than pretending. He, he pretends that he is approaching these issues of, in, in a scientifically minded way. And I just, I hope, this episode has demonstrated that couldn't be further from the truth. No, he's a, he's approaching it uh, in a, closer to demonology than he is to careful science. And the sad thing is, I think he genuinely believes himself to be a careful, scientific, empirically minded person who yeah. he must know that he's lying about the amount of books that he's read and stuff like somewhere in his brain there is a compartment which knows that he there isn't enough time in the universe to have read all the things that he's claimed right and he doesn't have the statistical competence that he constantly presents himself as as having but 
I think Jordan's self mythos and degree of, you know, confidence in his beliefs is absolute rock solid ideological commitments and narcissism mean that he does believe in the moment what he says about, you know, they're not being the work done, the evidence not being clear, that it's all because of his careful examination. Like, I think he says that with the conviction of a true believer, even though it can constantly be demonstrated that he's either intentionally not being accurate. You know, he's lying and, and he might be lying to himself as well as, uh, and that is how I would read it. You know, I, I think he's delusional in, in essence about the degree to which his views are based on science and that kind of thing. Oh yeah, certainly. I mean, this is the thing that crops up again and again, which is, which is, is someone being um, deliberately deceptive because they've got a, a, like a, either they've got secret political motives or maybe they've got financial motives or, or they're trying to appeal to their audience, but they're, but they're consciously lying as opposed to them just being frankly delusional and being just as crazy as they sound. Um, and they are in good faith, if you like, um, about, <laughs> about their crazy opinions. And, you know, the, the truth is, and the interesting thing is that I think that, that it's both is happening at the same time. We've talked about this, that the way that cognitive dissonance works, the way that people tend to align their beliefs with their actions, and they generally take actions that are in their best interests. You know, in this case, we'll yeah. be leading to more clicks, more attention, more, more positive feedback. You do, you're doing more of that kind of thing. That's what you want to do. You, you find a way to align your beliefs to those. There's, an, there's another kind of dissonance resolving, which is like resolving the dissonance of your opinion or belief about a specific topic and make it, make it consonant with your broader worldview. So, so let's say Jordan Peterson is a, a conservative, is, a, is suspicious of the kinds of things like climate change. He might have come across some opinions about climate change being a genuine thing. It, you know, he, he likes to think of himself as a scientist. He might have felt it, felt it convincing, but he would be strongly compelled to, to, to find some problems with that and find a way to allow himself to uh, disregard that information such that he can form an opinion about climate change that is fully aligned with his broader worldview. And, you know, I, I don't think the gurus are special in that regard. Um, you know, everybody, all of us are prone to doing that backwards kind of reasoning where you start off with your conclusions, you start off with your your deeply held beliefs, and then you work backwards and find out a way that you can deal with the, the various bits of evidence broadly construed uh, in, in, in such a way that allows you to come to the conclusions um, that you've already decided upon. And we'd like to believe that we, we start from whatever evidence, whatever information is available and work forward to beliefs and then revise those beliefs or, or even and more general sort of worldviews based on that. But um, sadly, we are mere mortals and we're not very good at that. Yeah, and this point stands <laughs> irregardless of the... Uh, current replication rules about some issues with the cognitive dissonance literature, right? Just for, just I can hear the psychologists in yeah. my head raising this. This this is not the same as the uh, various claims made about cognitive dissonance not mm. holding up um, because yeah. the basic idea that yeah. people seek to resolve inconsistencies in a way that's psychologically satisfying is obviously true. Now, that isn't also to say though, Matt, that Everyone does things. These are all psychological mechanisms which uh, afflict everyone, you know, motivated reasoning and all these kind of things, but not to the same extent as like a Jordan Peterson. No. He is unusual. The conspiratorial ideation, the belief in the malevolent power animating essentially every position that he doesn't like, right? That is not normal. He is an outlier in that perspective. So it is right to have, you know, empathy and to acknowledge that we're all fallible, but we're not all alleging the kind of things that Jordan does publicly, reliably. And I think this, these clips, this episode should illustrate that uh, while he was always not great, right? And you heard like his early climate change take, which is not that different from his current one, but overall, He's become much more extreme. He's much more closer to Alex Jones now than when he initially appeared. And it might be to a certain extent in delivery, but I think it is also 
in the degree to which the conspiratorial worldview mm. has uh, encompassed everything that yeah, and, and I think and I think as you said, Chris, it's not just a conspiratorial worldview. It, it's also that like demon infested millennial yeah. religious worldview. For for Jordan, these things go together. Like 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 those things go together for a lot of flat earthers, actually, now I think of it. Or QAnon. Yeah, or QAnon. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's pretty probably pretty common. But what's your thought? I mean, so there's clearly been a dissent. It hasn't been good. And Jordan is not alone amongst our gurus to have traced such a journey. Yeah. What would you attribute it to? Would he have become like this if he had not become a celebrity? It just, just gotten a bit older and and a bit more you know, weird as we all do, or like, is it his his psychology, his personality, or is it something to do with the social and financial dynamics? I think that in Jordan Peterson, early Jordan Peterson style, that there is multiple contributing factors, but there are some which are clearly uh, highly significant. One is that he's (laughs) appears to be a grandiose narcissist and that he always saw himself as uh, a kind of revolutionary thinker with big ideas, right? His Maps of Meaning book is claiming to absolutely revolutionize our understanding of so many topics, right? And to be of great significance to the world. And that's before he had much of a public profile. He sought out a public profile. He wanted to be a commentator. You know, he would appear on Canadian television in a tweed outfit or whatever, like, you know, the bowler hat or I I don't know how to describe his look, but he clearly wanted to be uh, a figure of commentary, a figure of note, and saw that as his role. And his old mentor mentioned about how he spoke about, you know, wanting to establish a religion to buy an old church and, and kind of give sermons, right? So that's not normal. None of that's normal behavior. His railing against the IRB review ethics board from having the right to, you know, examine his work for the standard thing, which all academics go through when they're trying to do research with people regarding that as being, you know, beyond the pale that he would, they would dare or have the right to assess him. All that speaks to a kind of narcissistic, self-absorbed personality. And then I think when you add to that his clear obsessions and constant wrestling with his religious devotions or lack of religious belief or with his desire to be religious, that creates, you know, a kind of heady stew and one which is also illustrated by the amount of illnesses that he has picked up. You know, he's got so many autoimmune, so many uh, psychological and physical ailments. Yeah, so I I think that all speaks to a personality which is not normal and which is susceptible to perceiving itself as a guru figure. And then when you add to that the reception of the social media audiences, the YouTube clips, and a partisan polemical ecosystem which he slotted into and was encouraged repeatedly by people in those ecosystems you know to to give more takes to offer his opinion on more things to talk about ukraine to have a very financially rewarding uh pundit position at the daily wire he's been constantly provided positive feedback by audiences by the right-wing ecosystem and even in some respects just the general media ecosystem, which fed him huge amounts of attention, huge amounts of accolades. So, yeah, I think all of that mixes in together. But it's clear when you look back at his early content that although he wasn't as far gone as he is now, he is essentially now just Alex Mm. Jones in a suit. Much like Brett Weinstein is Alex Jones cosplaying as a scientist. But Jordan was more an academic with tendencies towards grandiosity and like a, you know, a really strong political streak. And now he isn't that, right? So there has been a change, but I I don't think it's that is, is lots of people have pointed out that, you know, it was after he had the coma that things started to go like extremely wrong. And I, I don't think that's, I think the cracks were all there 
pre yeah. um comma. Yeah, I like your thesis there and I I basically agree. We've said before that it's perhaps that the grandiose narcissism is the is a secret piece of the puzzle that makes these things, you know, progressively get more and more extreme. The seeds are there, the the personality characteristics are there, but then because of the the narcissism, the the attention and the rewards is just like throwing petrol on a fire. Yeah. I think we saw all of these same features in, and I'm thinking of Jordan here, but also of other people we've covered, um, Brett Weinstein, uh, James Lindsay. Like you could see some concerning signs, but the, I think how you'd characterize it is that they were more careful then, like that they weren't quite as big, you know, they weren't quite as self-assured. They weren't quite as confident in themselves. Yeah. And the the main difference in in their content between now and before is that now that they have like complete confidence that they can say and do sort of anything in a way. Yeah, and they're right. Mm. They're right. Like this would be well, it should be absolutely destructive to, of Jordan's credibility. Various things that he said in the interview with Destiny, but it's. It's not. It's just Tuesday. It's just Tuesday. Yeah, you know, exactly. he'll say more things tomorrow, and his yep. audience will grow. And he can constantly reference the millions of people that are still saying he's great, and and yep. so on. So I, I just like with say someone like Donald Trump, like it does. Like when you get increasingly more batshit crazy, like it, it doesn't matter if the people that already didn't like you dislike you. Yeah, more. don't like you more. No, yeah, that, that doesn't matter, right? Um, and the constituency, like you said, I've I've seen I've seen the comments of Jordan Peterson fans about videos like this. And and they don't see it. They don't see anything amiss. No. In Constantine Kessin would sign off on all of this. He might, if he might say Hitler was right wing, but who knows? Like, yeah, it might be uh, just a couple of months before you yeah. hear to see him playing give, on the stage. Give yeah, him time. So give give him time, Chris. Give him time. <laughs> yeah. He's just starting out. He hasn't been doing this as long as Jordan. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a depressing journey into the mind of a self-indulgent ideologue. But that's what we do. <laughs> that's what we do. That's what we do. So, that's right. It's, yeah. uh, you know, it's not a glamorous job, but someone's got to do it. Um, well, thank that's you, right. Chris. I enjoyed this mini decoding. Yeah. Let's see where he goes from here. Brett has already been on InfoWars. Will Jordan join him at some point? You know, let's see. Mm. He doesn't really need to. He doesn't need to. We should. I'm not a gambling man, but uh, we should have one of those um, betting markets. You know what I mean? You know how they have betting markets? <laughs> yeah. We could have various things like that. Will Jordan Peterson? is going in for wars that would be I'd like yeah, to, yeah i would ha have had good odds that brett is going to appear jordan on Infowars. i kind of feel like he doesn't need it he already has the daily wires so like what's the what's the benefit fair enough all right well thanks chris uh we'll see you soon we're gonna we're gonna stay away from people like jordan for a little while next up is What's his name again? <laughs> you, Yuval Noah Harari, who yeah. is the lapdog of the WEF. He is one of the villains <laughs> in, you know, Jordan Peterson's pantheon. So we're going to look into the eyes of Satan and see what dark malevolent forces look yeah. underneath. So, yeah, some kind, yeah. Of, some kind of awful utopian or dystopian future is what he wants, I'm sure. Or anti-dystopian. We'll, we'll find out. We'll look at Yuval and maybe we'll <laughs> discover that Jordan was right. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll have to eat a crow. So let's see. All right. Okay. See you, Chris. Bye.